if you will, a cosmic clock ticking not in seconds but in centuries. Instead of measuring the spin of planets, we're measuring something just as fundamental to our human story, the wealth. We can call it gross domestic product or GDP. GDP is the total value of everything a country makes and all the services it provides in a year. It's a snapshot of a nation's economic energy. A bigger GDP means more activity, more stuff, more power. It's a way to take the temperature of a civilization to see how vibrant its economic heart is beating at any given moment in history. Think of our journey as a race, a Grand Prix of nations spanning nearly 500 years. The contestants are empires, kingdoms, republics. The race track is the globe itself. The rules of this race change constantly, shaped by discovery, invention, conflict. Some races, once far ahead, will spin out and fall behind. Others, starting from the back, will surge forward. We're not just watching numbers. We witness human ambition and ingenuity, and sometimes our devastating capacity for destruction, all told through the language of economics. This story begins in a world lit by candlelight and powered by sail. Pause. Our story starts in the 1560s. The world's economic center of gravity is not where you might think. It's not in Europe. It's not in the Americas. It is in Asia. Ming China, Mughal India, vast populations, sophisticated agriculture, massive production of goods, silk and spices, giant self-contained economic stars radiating wealth. In Europe, a new power was stirring. Spain, flush with silver and gold from the Americas, beginning its Siglo de Oro, built on conquest and extraction. Great fleets set sail, mines at Potosi, modern-day Bolivia. Silver poured into chests, loaded for shipment. Ships arrive in Seville. This influx reshaped the global economy, a first truly global currency connecting Europe, the Americas and Ming China. Spain used this wealth to fund massive armies and navies, projecting power worldwide for a time seemingly untouchable, the first European superpower. But relying on treasure instead of creating value has consequences. Spain's wealth was built on taking, not making. While silver flowed in, the economy didn't innovate. Industries failed to develop. Inflation rose. Like a star burning too brightly, brilliance masked in a decay, a lesson in economic history. Wealth from resources alone is often fleeting while others watched and learned. The Netherlands, England, focusing on trade, finance, innovation, better ships, the VOC, and the first stock markets. The seeds of Spain's decline and its rivals' rise were sown at its peak. Pause. As the Spanish star faded, a new one began to shine with an intensity the world had never seen, Great Britain. Its ascent wasn't fueled by gold, but by an idea human and animal muscle could be replaced by machines. This was the Industrial Revolution. Its true heart was the steam engine. Pumping water from coal mines, powering looms, driving locomotives and steamships, steam was rocket fuel for Britain's launch. Coal was the secret ingredient, condensed ancient sunlight, and Britain learned to unlock it. Factories sprang up in Manchester and Liverpool. For the first time, output wasn't limited by harvests or muscle, but by ingenuity and coal, as profound as the discovery of fire. Britain became the workshop of the world, from iron to cloth for a global market. Industrial might was projected by the world's most powerful navy, protecting routes, securing resources, enforcing imperial will. This was colonization at industrial scale. Captive markets and cheap resources, cotton from India, rubber from Malaya, the global economy was rewired to serve one small island. By mid-century, the empire spanned a quarter of land and population the largest economy on earth. France, a unified Germany, and the distant United States played catch-up, copying and improving the British model. For nearly a century, Britain led, but its own technologies armed its rivals, setting the stage for the next shift. Pause. The dawn of the 20th century marked the beginning of the end for the old European order. Centuries of empires and alliances were torn apart by unprecedented wars. The first half of the century was absolute chaos. World War I, the Great Depression, World War II. Great Britain and France emerged victorious but economically broken. Their empires began to crumble. Into the vacuum stepped two giants, the United States and the Soviet Union. Insulated by oceans, the US had become an industrial powerhouse, supplying allies with ships, planes, tanks. While Europe lay in ruins, American cities were untouched. By 1945, the US produced nearly half the world's industrial output. The American century had begun. 
The Soviet Union, born from empire's ashes, proposed a different system. The state controlled everything, communism. Through brutal five-year plans, it transformed from agrarian to industrial, capable of defeating Nazi Germany's war machine. For decades, a bipolar world, USA versus USSR, a cosmic dance of two massive stars, capitalism and free trade versus a centrally planned command economy. Competition spurred breakthroughs even to the moon. Yet the Soviet system proved rigid and inefficient. It couldn't match Western innovation and consumer growth. Cracks in its foundation began to show. Pause. While superpowers stared each other down, the world rebuilt, and some reinvented themselves. The US didn't punish former enemies. It helped rebuild Germany and Japan through the Marshall Plan, smart economics. West Germany's Wirtschaftswunder restored Europe's industrial heartland. Japan, devastated, transformed into a titan with aid and relentless manufacturing quality. It started with toys and textiles, then advanced to electronics, ships and cars, Toyota, Sony, Honda. By the 1980s, Japan was second largest. Some thought it would overtake the US. The miracle spread. South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, the four Asian tigers, surged on exports and education. Resource poor, they invested in people, embraced export-led growth and manufactured for the world. South Korea leapt from poor, war-torn fields to leaders in shipbuilding, steel and electronics. Samsung, Hyundai. Wealth no longer required empires or resources. It needed education, stable pro-business governance and access to global markets. Japan and the Tigers surprised many, proving destinies aren't fixed. With strategy and hard work, small nations can become giants. Pause. As the 20th century closed, two shifts reshaped everything. First, a technological revolution, the microprocessor and the internet, ushered in the digital age. Distance collapsed, new industries emerged, old ones transformed. The United States solidified its lead. Second, the geopolitical order shifted. In 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved. The Cold War ended. The bipolar world vanished. At that moment, China awakened. Deng Xiaoping's reforms opened the economy. A model of state capitalism, party control plus market mechanisms. Leveraging massive low-cost labor, China became the factory of the world. Clothes, toys, iPhones, computers. Hundreds of millions left poverty. Cities grew dizzyingly, rice paddies to skyscrapers. Shanghai's skyline tells the story. Growth neared double digits for years. In 2010, China surpassed Japan. By 2025, the US-China race defines the landscape. China leads in areas like 5G and renewables. Unlike the Cold War, their economies are intertwined. A complex mix of competition and codependence shaping the world. So here we are at journey's end. We've seen empires rise on silver and fall to inflation. We've seen coal and steam forge empires, wars birth new superpowers, and defeated nations become miracles. Nothing is permanent. Prosperity favors innovation, adaptation, education, openness,